Everything is wrong. Tash's body, yours now, hangs and clings like a wet cloak. The world is too bright for night time. Everything is too crisp. Distances too close, edges too hard. Memories like blood flies buzz about your head, whizzing away before you can catch them. Hard-ridden anine heave their flanks and half behind you. Like you, they've gone too long without rest. And there's Matkina, a much newer Matkina, as drawn by a pandering portraitist. Too soft, too fresh, too pretty, all wrong. On the wastes you see the light of campfires, and in the humble village before you a bigger, brighter fire burns. It's a pyre. Inside a body that's too large burns too slowly. Greasy coils of smoke rise into the night. Villagers circle the bonfire, wailing and tearing at, her, at their skin and hair. The headman's rough voice continues the ritual. From exile you are released, among the mourners so, some echo. You are released. He throws a handful of powder into the fire. Metal salts, perhaps, and a spray of shining embers rises into the night. Mostly gold, some green, some purple. From wrath you are released. They echo him. From wrath you are released. As the embers float out towards the plains and fade among the stars and campfires, you hear Matkina whisper. You are released. Stare at the distant campfires and try to see what they are. You squint your unnatural eyes and focus until the pyre, the village, everything else fades away. At last the blurry campfires resolve into something crisper and you see the faint shadows of men around them, men in long coats and broad hats, painstakingly clearing, cleaning their jezails and daggers. There are perhaps a hundred of them. But Kina sees you staring and grunts, Sand Knights. From her tone it's obvious that there are no friends of hers or yours. What's going on here, Matkina? Matkina answers without looking your way. Her eyes are locked on the fire and the flesh inside it. It's what they do when one of the hill people dies. Never a burial, always upward. Plains people like me, we can bring kindling and weep. But we're forbidden to join the chant. After a pause, she adds, I never got used to the smell of it. Even when they burned juniper or balsam. It's worse at the end. She shrugs. When it's done, there's no more wailing for them. It really is a release. She looks thoughtful, but says no more. Hmm. Try to remember who you are and why you are here. The memories try to buzz away, but you are too quick for them. You seize them and squeeze. His body is, you are Tash. You already knew that, but now you know yourself as you didn't before. The body fits better. You're a cast off and when you call on the tides, you can destroy memories. You're a soldier of sorts in service of the militia, under the command of Paj Reckon. You're a scout, Matkina's spotter. The two of you are not warriors, you're specialists, you're killers. But you're not here to kill. You're here to promise something to villagers and to get an object, a flute of some sort, the jack. As for why, that memory and others remain beyond your reach. Matkina, listen to me. We need to find the jack and protect your memories. Find the what? Matkina stares at you dumbfounded and then she shakes her head. Have a little respect, Tash. This is my home. We are here to save people I've known for years. A moment later she adds, not to mention the only danger to memories around here is you, Tash. Try your tidal surge on me and I'll burn those fancy eyes right out of your skull. There's a smile on her face, like this isn't the first time Tash has teased her or that she's promised a grisly fate in response. But Kina, this isn't a joke. You sent me here. Now there's no laughter in her hard glare and for a moment she truly looks like the woman who sent you here. Enough, Tash. She hisses. They are mourning a murdered man over there, and him? She points to the headman. 
he as good as raised me. I know these people. This means something to me, even if the whole world and everything wrong with it is just a barking joke to you. She looks away from you and back into the pyre. And we'll need to barge into the ritual to do this, because we're intellectuals. We don't believe in, in rituals, we believe in knowledge. And knowledge is being burned here, so barge into the ritual. You push past Matkina and into the ring of light cast by the burning body. The headman gives you gives n you no acknowledgement. And before you can say a word, Matkina jerks you backward. Lark Nibber, these things matter to them, to me. When the ritual at last ends and the mourners move on, she leads you to the smoldering pyre, where the headman stands alone. He sniffs at your approach. Kina, he says. And a stranger. His eyes are large, milky marbles. He put his hands on her shoulders. You return in unpleasant times. She touches his cheek. I return because the times are unpleasant, Ning. Without another word, the three of you withdraw from the fire and enter Neng's home. Neng's home is humble and small, hardly furnished and wholly undecorated. On entering, he lowers his weary bulk unto a hassock and gestures towards similar cushions for you and Matkina, then begins without preamble. They hung him from a tree, old Garab took their daggers to him, called it pruning, blind to others' expressions, he has become oblivious to his own, and he wears his pain and anger nakedly. The grunt, he continues, they sent him o home by skimmer, along with a compact they'd made to the plains people. He waves at the crumpled sheet of paper on the floor. Tick, read it to me. They've promised to put an end to our menace, Kina. He shakes his head. Why? We've always paid the blood price for whatever harm we've done. You know that. They know that. Yes, Matkina says softly. But the Sand Knights won't take shins. You know that. He grunts. The militia is here to help, Neng. You are who we stand for. The small, the threatened, the hunted. That's who we are too. She takes his hand. Come away. If you tell the knights you're going, they won't force a fight. They have bigger battles ahead of them, believe me. This is our place, Kina, he says. Pajrekan will give you a home. Trust her. Neng is silent. Oh, what a story. Something re really strange is going on, and maybe this is connected to the murders in the underbelly. With all the blood the strange deaths. Hmm. Read the crumpled note. You unfold the compact, compact sent by the Sand Knights. The writing is neat, plain, small and seems to go on and on in tightly stacked lines. In essence, it is a vow to safeguard the villages and towns of the Virxulian Waste from the menace in Colne Village. The knights promise that they will undertake steps to assure that the killers in Colne Village never harm anyone again. Extermination is never mentioned, merely implied. Beneath the knight marshals chop are signatures from various burghers, mayors and elders of towns and villages on the waste. The knights ask nothing in return from them. The signatures vow nothing, they merely endorse, justifying whatever the knights undertake. What happened to your eyes? Matkina gives you a hard look, but Neng merely shrugs. An accident long forgotten, he rubs the blind orbs with a thick, with his thick, grubby fingers, then shakes his head. It is a smaller thing than you might think. The world is full of places, Neng. This hill of yours is nothing special. He heaves a heavy sigh. Maybe that's true, stranger. This hill, this village, it's no more our home than anywhere else in this world. Then he shakes his head, but we can't just go. Matkina answers, her voice soft but insistent. 
Neng, I know this is your home. It was my home too, but it's not safe here. But Reckon has set aside land for all of you, deep inside your territory, where we can protect you. Not so simple, he answers. Not though so easy, plains people cannot understand. Matkina hisses in frustration and gives you a look. It seems she's hoping you can move, the stubborn old fool. The only time it's too late to start a new life is when you're dead. Give your people a chance to survive. Neng snots slowly. You're right, of course, even if you've got the manners of a Ureal marauder. After a minute he turns his blind eyes to Matkina. But we can't go without the jack. The what? Matkina asks. Up the hill behind the gate. Cave's been sealed for generations. Inside is the jack. It's what keeps helps us keep our worst instincts inside. If we leave its song, he trails off, gesturing to the pyre outside. After a pause, he leans in, whispers in Matkina's ear. Now, he says, you alone of the plains people know how to open the gate. And there's the gate seems enchanted it seems like dimensional with all the flying stones around them the strange symbols you work your way up the terraced hillside leaving neng to make his case to the to his people in the distance you see the sand knights are on the move riding hard toward Colne village neng will need to make his case to them too when you arrive at the cave and its huge ancient gateway matkina shakes her head for years i wondered about this she says, the hill people tell a fable that the first men and women came out of here. They said the gate would only open when it was time for people to disappear. She shrugs. One way to keep kids from poking around and disturbing the jagger, I guess. Something she said stirs your subconscious and your memories jingle like a wind chime. Try to dredge up the memory that is troubling you. At once a glaring light shines over your mission, as painful as it is, as is revealing. You're not here to help Pudge Reckon save Corn Village, you're here to help Pudge destroy it. She knew about the Teratomorphs, knew about the Jack. Most importantly, she knew the Sand Knights would come, knew about their compact. The plan isn't to take the villagers out of the Knights' way. In fact, it depends on causing the very battle Matkina promised would be averted. When the knights arrive, Pudge will destroy the jack, forcing the hill people into their feral state, unleashing them upon the knights, weakening one of the militia's foes, and Pudge is coming in person to see that all goes right. Oh. Now we're in a dream here and we have to save the jack. So, to help Matkina get knowledge and get knowledge to us, knowledge is more important than that in the dream. So, Matkina, we can't open that gate. Padrekin is planning to destroy the jark and with it the entire village. You hurriedly related your memory of Pudge's plot, how she and an armed band will be waiting to take the jack and destroy it in order to unleash the Teratomorphs upon the Sand Knights in a living trap. At a certain level, the betrayal is so audacious, the plot so callous, that it is unbelievable, and at first Matkina is incredulous. But then her face hardens and her eyes flash with rage. You're serious, aren't you? She scans the horizon for Pudge, and so do you, but there's no sign of her. We need to get as far away as we can, she says decisively. decisively. Draw Pudge off, binding time to negotiate with the Sand Knights and keep them from the jack. You're barely a hundred meters up the hillside before a deafening shriek fills the air and seven people seem to drop out of the sky. One of them is a woman you know immediately to be Pudge Reckon. The others must be her bodyguard, tattooed castoffs with drab armor, mismatched weapons and the languid readiness of predators. 
Despite the surprise, Matkina flings a knife before they even hit the ground and it sleeps between the plates in one glaive's armor. She's throwing another when a beam of light envelops her, trapping her in a field of energy. As Matkina thrashes about, their attention is clearly focused on her, giving you an opening, slight as it might, might be. Um, and we'll have to help her survive. There's no trying to reason with them. We'll have to help her survive or she, she may be dead in real life. So attack them before they can hurt her. You rush forward knowing that you have only an instant until the killer's eyes and arms are turned on you. The instant is shorter than you expect and it is the last you know. Pain engulfs you. Your body is flung backward into the gate, a smoldering ruin that has just enough consciousness to know that this is the end and then it's over and you're slaving off Tash's body, Tash's mind. And all is dark. Shock and quiet awe have wiped away her usual cynicism. Matkina's, that is. What what did you do? I remember Tesh cutting me. I see the holes in my mind and the scars on my face. But I remember him not cutting me. I remember fighting the first militia and Tesh forcing me to the ground, tearing out my history. She shakes. But my memories are there. Tash didn't do it. She holds her head in her hands, shaking, her voice becoming thick. It's pulling me apart. She looks up at you, tears streaming down her cheeks. No, it's pulling me back together. I remember now that hole is... It's almost gone. You changed reality. You changed it. She stands, drying her tears with her sleeves. I don't know if you meant to do that, but you've done more than your part of the deal. You asked about the resonance chamber. I know it. Mazov's the guy you want. He can fix anything. He might have even helped design the chamber you're talking about. Your best bet is to look for him in the cast-off sanctuary. Miel Avest. There's a cast-off sanctuary? It's a hidden fortress created by the first and our sire. It's shielded from the sorrow, supposedly. She shrugs. Our siblings like to hide there until they can't stand each other's company anymore. Scan thoughts. Personally, I don't think anywhere safe from the sorrow, not even that place. Great. Where can I find Mielavest? Word of caution. They won't believe you in Mielavest. They'll treat you like they treat every new cast of as a pawn in their games with each other. Each other. Look out for that. She walks on her table and unrolls a map of the Sagas Protectorate. You're not going to find it by walking to it. The entrance is a secret, known only to your kind, here. She points to a spot on the map, many kilometers to the north of Sagos Cliffs. The Valley of Dead Heroes. There's a hidden portal in the necropolis. Also memorize this. She writes a number down on a slip of paper, holds it in front of your eyes for several seconds, then crumples it in her hand. It's a code. It will make sense when you get to the ne necropolis. You'll need an airship to get to the valley. Head to the caravanserai. You should be able to hire one without too much difficulty. Um, thank you. Can I ask some other questions? Fine. What do you want? <sighs> What's the story with you and the other castoffs? She gives you a long, slow look. You were in the mirror. You saw what happened. I wanted to make a difference, and they pissed on my hopes. After the debacle, I killed Tash and fell out with the rest of them. She frowns. The conflict between the first and the changing god swallows all our siblings, one way or another. I didn't want that. I wanted to make my own way. They weren't pleased, and here I am, no worse for the lack of their company. And we'll make a pause now because I'm running out of time. I hope I can continue this just here without her disappearing. So farewell for now. And thank you, Matkina. And thank you, my viewers, for watching. See you in the next episode when we in will inquire Matkina more and we'll try to recruit her as well. So this is Emmanuel Kahn wishing you happy gaming and signing out.